you are also most welcome to stand and just worship the Lord for who you are. For God created you uniquely. God created us individually uniquely. So let's worship the living God and let's give him praise for who he is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, O oh God. We lift you up on high. We thank you for tonight, Jesus. We just want to lift up everything to you. We want to thank you for the teaching and the preaching of your word through our speaker for tonight, through Dr. George. Lord, we want to thank you for opening the hearts of men, for opening their, their hearts, their minds, their ears to hear. And Jesus, we bless you for who you are, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, oh God. We bless you. Yeah. 
Jesus. We worship you, Abba Father. We worship you, Holy Spirit. We want you to be exalted. We want you to be lifted up. God, come. Come, Lord, and manifest your praise. We want you. Oh, oh, oh. Hallelujah. Welcome to the house of God. Welcome to the house of God. Amen. Amen. On behalf of my better half, Pastor Terrence, we would like to apologize for his absence. He is now at Ipo doing revival meetings, and I had a talk with him just now, and he said that they are having a wonderful meetings, and he will be back tomorrow for our 5 p.m. service. And... We are grateful that we are here tonight for King's Convention. It is an honor to have the man of God with us tonight to give us teachings. Apostle George will be doing teachings for this 5.30 p.m. set and even for the second half later during 8 p.m. And tomorrow he will be doing a preaching and teaching and at the same time ministering um, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight because I want him to have the time to teach and uh, that we are able to receive more. Our speaker tonight is an apostolic father. He's a father of faith to the nations. Dr. George is the founder and senior pastor of the Lord's Family Church in Singapore. That was the year from year 1982 till year 2001. He was also a member of the Love Singapore leadership team during the year 1995 to year 2001. Since 2001, he has undertaken the next level of his calling to serve the nation of Israel. Dr. George has received several commendations from the Israel Israeli Knesset. Did I pronounce it right? 
for his many services rendered to different groups within Israel under the banner of Shalom Israel, Asia Pacific. Dr. George also works with 12 nations in the East, that is in Asia Pacific, connecting pastors, professionals in the marketplace, and politicians with the nation of Israel via the Isaiah Highway at 1962. He's also a husband of one wife. And just now I heard him, he says that he's been married with his wife for 42 years. Wow, that's a long years of relationship. And he's a father of two and a grandfather of one. We don't, don't have a, so much further ado. Let us welcome the man of the hour, Apostle George and Adora. God bless you, Pastor. Let's just... Bless him tonight. Good evening, family. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to bring greetings from one island to another. From Pulau Singapura to Pulau Pinang. You don't hear that often. Huh? For those of you who don't know, um, I w was um, manufactured in Malaysia but assembled in Singapore. If you don't understand what I just said, uh, my dad comes from Ipo. My mom comes from Pulau Penang, Penang. They were born here and raised here. And then at some point in their life, they migrated to Singapore, got married, and I came forth. So my parents were originally Malaysians. So that's why I said I was manufactured in Malaysia, but assembled in Singapore. Now that you understand that. Before I introduce the teachings to you, I would like to just briefly recap two moments in my life where I would say were radical turning points. One was in 82 when my missionary brother died in a automobile accident here in Malaysia. My brother was devoted. He devoted his entire life to serve Malaysia. He was a church planter and during one of his church planting trips, he was, he met with a collision with the timber lorry, Lori Balak, and he died on the spot. And his last request was that um, his elder brother, myself, will never forget Malaysia. That's all he said, don't forget Malaysia, and then he died. So for that reason, Malaysia has become very much a part of me. And um, wherever I am, Malaysia always has a special place in my heart and my mind. So that was one radical turning point in 82, and the next radical turning point in my life came in 1998 when I was visiting Israel, Jerusalem, just like any one of you. I went in there as a tourist, not expecting anything else, just to see some sights and come back with some photos. But then the Lord had other plans. Um, the Lord visited me uh, there in Jerusalem in the year 1998, and that encounter with the Lord... Um, in many ways messed me up just like the encounter that Moses had with the Lord on Mount Sinai Exodus 3 and the encounter that Paul had with Jesus Acts chapter 9 that messed them up anyone who encounters the Lord is messed up and I was messed up messed up in many ways but mostly theologically because prior to 1998 I was teaching in the end times for as long as 20 years in three different Bible schools back in Singapore. All right, so my version of the end times is your version of the end times. And our version of the end times is the version that our professors, our teachers taught us, mostly from the West, especially from America. So that's what I taught for 20 years. Until this moment of visitation, the encounter in Jerusalem, 1998, that radically messed up my theology concerning the end times. So shaken up, I had to go back to the Word of God to understand yet once again what the Word, has, word of God has to say concerning the end times. So I began to study the book of Revelation, chapter 1, chapter 22. There are four and four verses. As I began to read, and then again, and then to read again, and then to read again, I realized that what I knew about the end times was not exactly matching with what I saw in the book of Revelation, which is what 
I received in Jerusalem in the year 1998. And so I realized, like the Apostle Paul, who earnestly believed that what he had picked up in the past was from God until his encounter with the Lord and then everything was messed up. And then he realized that what he thought was true was not altogether true because one vital factor was missing, Jesus. And so he had to revise his theology. Like that, I too had to revise my end time theology by bringing one important factor in. And ever since that, I've read the book of Revelation over 150 times and um, it is my most favorite book in the Bible. It is for some, for many, the most feared book in the Bible. But it has become my most favorite book, not by choice. I was compelled to go into it and I've since come to love that. So as I want to take time tonight, uh, as we have parts one between now and until, um, what, 7.30, and then we come back from a light dinner and then we continue part two. So I would like to devote the entire book of Revelation and attempt to teach that in the two parts, uh, with part one between now and 7.30 and then part two from 8 to 10. So in order for me to maximize my time teaching this book, I want to humbly ask of you to give me the time to teach. And tomorrow when I come back for service, for those of you who are desiring to be ministered, to be prayed for, please uh, be here tomorrow evening for the service. I'll be happy to minister and to pray for you. But tonight I want to teach because I believe that this teaching is fundamental to leading a victorious life. And for many of us, we come back to the altar again and again, again and again, again and again, because we are living defeated lives. That's why we keep coming back to the altar. We don't see, quite see the victory that we have in Christ. Why is that? Because we need a, a radically new way to understand the life that we have in Christ. And I believe the book of Revelation goes a long way to give just that to you and I how to lead victorious lives. So for those of us who see Jesus becoming a victor over all things, victor, um, is in the book of Revelation, where he overcomes all things and becomes king of kings and as lord of lords. So what is it about him that we need to know in the book of Revelation that will allow you and I to overcome all obstacles and to become overcomers? That's what I believe the book of Revelation has the power to deliver. So with that, allow me to bring you to some things that I believe is important for you and I to know about the book of Revelation. Now, anyone here has read the book of Revelation? Good. All right, I see some brave souls here. <laughs> Thanks for that. So with that, let me take you into um, what I would like to say is there are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, 404 verses. And for a long time, the book of Revelation has remained an unopened book to many of us, especially if you are a lay person, you stay away from the book of Revelation. If you are a pastor, you are compelled to go to the book of Revelation, but then you find the book refuses to open itself up. And ever since 1998, I discovered the key that unlocks the book of Revelation, I have become quite familiar. I will never say that I've become very, very familiar with the book of Revelation. Nobody can. But I've become quite familiar with what the word of God through John appears to us in the book of Revelation. So if you have 22 chapters in all, uh, the way to understand the book of Revelation is to divide the entire book right down the middle. And if you do that, we come to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is a pivotal chapter that um, closes one part of the revelation and opens another part of the revelation. So if I can draw an imaginary line before you, an X, an X, and this center where the lines converge, zero is I, the letter I. I stands for Israel. Israel is the missing factor. Israel is the missing piece in the puzzle. For such a long time, as Christians, we have been trying to unlock the book of Revelation, but the book refuses to be opened up until you bring Israel in. 
and as a Christian just like you, I was raised um, as a believing Christian for a long time and never understood where Israel fitted into God's end time plans. Israel was not on my radar screen until 1998. That's 21 years now. That year opened my eyes to see Israel as God sees Israel. And uh, since that, everything begins to make sense to me. So if you don't mind me, um, I'm an Indian, you can see. And Indians don't like to stand still. They like to move around. Okay? So give me the liberty to move around. I hope I'm not a nightmare to the video person. Are we okay? All right. So if X, this is I, Israel. So the way to understand is chapters 1 through 11 and then chapters 13 through 22 with 12 in the middle. 12 is the pivotal chapter. So 1 through 11. What's 1 through 11 all about? 1 through 11 is before all Israel is saved. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. And then Revelation 13 to 22 is after all Israel is saved. So the simplest way to understand what the book of Revelation is trying to say to us is, first of all, you have to bring Israel into the equation. If you do not bring Israel into the equation, the book refuses to open itself up. I tried, just like you, 20 years, never opened up. And then the moment I used the password, Israel, poof, it opened up. So before all Israel is saved, the first half, after all is really saved, the second half. So the first half, I like to devote chapters 1 through 11, maybe concluding with chapter 12, and then I'll pick up chapter 12 once again when we come back. So with that, I have prepared some slides. So I want you to take a look at these slides to help you remember as we go through. So there are many ways to um, package the book of Revelation. So this is one way, all right? Many ways to package the book of Revelation. So this is how I would like to present this to you this evening because we are at the King's Convention. So if Jesus is here and he is, what would he like to say to us at a time such as this? Now Jesus being Jesus, I believe this is what he will be saying to us if instead of myself he is here. The revelation of the king and the restoration of his kingdom in the book of Revelation. I think we as Christians need a radical revision. When I say revision, I don't mean repeat revision, re-hyphen vision. We need a radical revision of Jesus. Because the Jesus we see in the Gospels comes to us as a savior, but the Jesus we see in the book of Revelation comes to us not as savior, he's come to us as the king of kings and as a lord of lords. Now that's the radical revision we need Jesus. Most of us are stuck with the Jesus of the Gospels and that's the Jesus we all know. We all came to know through the Jesus of the Gospels who came to us as Savior. But the Jesus in the last book of the Bible the book of Revelation comes to us as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. Which is why a radical revision, re-hyphen vision of Jesus is absolutely needed in the churches today. And that vision of Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords will do something for you and I. That's the Jesus who makes you and I an overcomer. That's the Jesus who says to John and to the seven churches, He who overcomes, Revelation 2.7. He who overcomes, Revelation 2.11. He who overcomes, Revelation 2.17. He who overcomes, Revelation 2.29. He who overcomes, Revelation 3.6. He who overcomes, Revelation 3.13. He who overcomes, Revelation 3 verse 22. Seven times he says to the churches, he who overcomes. Seven times. So, the essence of you and I becoming an overcomer is the key to living a victorious life. Otherwise, we end up coming to the altar week after week, week after week, week after week, get slain, roll on the carpet, go home. Next Sunday, come back, get fall, fall on the carpet, roll over, and come back again. We don't lead victorious life. And that's not the life you and I were called to live. You and I were called to live a victorious life. The time for us to minister to others, not being ministered to again and again and again and again. Some of us full-time being ministered to. This altar call is a full-time thing for many Christians. Why are we like this? 
we are supposed to live and lead overcoming lives. We are living defeated lives because we lack the right vision of Jesus. So the re vision of Jesus is what we need. And even the first chapter, chapter 1, first verse, listen to what John writes, the very first verse. A revelation of Jesus Christ whom God gave. That's how the, the book of Revelation begins. In other words, God the Father is desperately wanting to give a fresh vision of Jesus to you and I and to the churches. A fresh vision. Why a fresh vision? Because the Jesus who appears in the Gospels is not exactly the Jesus who appears in the book of Revelation. Same Jesus, but in a very different form. In a very different authority. Therefore, we need to understand this Jesus who's coming back. And he is the one who is able to empower us to live victorious and overcome his life. So having said that, I want to show you in the slide some things for you to lay hold of and understand. Alright, so this is the book that I wrote on the book of Revelation after reading the book of Revelation 144 times. And then I felt that, okay, I have something to say. Alright, moving on. Now, three critical questions uh, for you to lay hold of um, how to be walking with God in the end times. So three qu- I have a request. Can you not take pictures of the slides while I'm teaching? I know you're not taking a picture of me, but the slide, but I am camera shy. So when you take your camera out, I, please. Sister, sister, no cameras. All right. The, the slides are going to be with Samantha. All right. I'm going to leave the slides there. So if you want to take a picture of the slide, go during the break, ask Samantha, show me this slide, take a picture directly, but don't take your camera, because the moment I freak out, and I lose my flow of thoughts. I'm a camera shy person, never like to be in cameras. Okay? Give me that understanding. Thank you very much. So, three important questions we need to ask in order to be able to walk with Jesus in the end times. And as Christians, we all know that we are already in the end times. That is nothing new. But what we need to know in hours such as this is, am I walking with Jesus in the end times? So in order to answer that question, we have three questions. Where are we now in the story that God is telling? I mean, I've, I've done this a thousand times. I've done this a million times. I've asked Christians across the nations. Can you tell me where exactly we are in the storyline that, in the story that God is telling? And unfortunately, not many Christians are able to pinpoint exactly where we are. Where exactly are we in the story that God is telling us? Are we in the beginning? Are we in the middle? Are we in the end? So many simply say we are in the end. Okay, where in the end? Where exactly are we in the end? We know we are in the end time, but where in the end? So that answer is critical to our walk. Okay? There are many who believe that the next big thing that's going to happen on God's calendar is the rapture. Question number two, what's the next big thing that must happen in the story that God is telling us? So for 20 years, I've been teaching Christians that the next big thing on God's calendar is the rapture. Because that's what I was taught. And then I began to study the book of Revelation and I discovered that, well, not exactly. The rapture is happening, but that's down the line. That's not the next big thing. That's one of the big things that are said to happen, but that's not the next big thing. So if that's not the next big thing, and if I'm not preparing myself for the next big thing, then I'm missing out on God's perfect will for my life. So that question needs to be answered biblically. What's the next big thing that must happen in the story that God is telling? Third question. How does the story that God is telling end? And most Christians have no clue as to how the story ends. Why? Because most have not read the book of Revelation. Most Christians, like you and I, we carry the idea that the story ends with you and I living with Jesus up there forever. But the book of Revelation has a different ending. You and I do not get to live with Jesus up there. According to the book of Revelation, you and I get to live with Jesus forever down here. Now, that's a startling revelation. It messes up many people's theology. It messed up mine. It messed up my theology because I never was taught that. I studied in seminary seven years. No professor ever told me that. But when I started to read the book of Revelation, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
you mean I am not spending my eternity with Jesus up there? You mean I am spending my eternity with Jesus down here? Yes. So that radically affected my, the way I lived. It changed everything about how I should live my life. So armed with these three questions, I am trying to lead you into the story. As I lead you into the story, I need you to understand this. A simple principle in the Bible. A very, very simple, clear principle in the Bible. How do you understand what God is doing in the end? The answer to the question is, if you want to understand what God is doing in the end, you have to first understand what God was doing in the beginning. A simple principle in the Bible. Okay, I'll repeat what I just said. For anyone who wants to understand how God is going, what God is going to do in the end, he first got to understand what God did in the beginning. I'll give you a sample. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, the first two chapters, Genesis 1 and 2. Before sin came, before Satan came, we have God, Adam, Eve in paradise. That's Genesis 1 and verse 2. Genesis 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2. Now fast forward, the last book of the Bible. The last two chapters, Revelation 21 and 22. You find this exact same thing repeated there. Now, that's the principle that you and I need to uphold. In other words, for me to understand the end, I have to first understand the beginning. If I don't have a good understanding of the beginning, I'll never have a good understanding of the end. So everything that happens in the middle is something that adds spice to the story. But to understand the end, you have to understand the beginning. Now, let me give you another statement. To understand the end, the end times church, what is Jesus going to do in the end times church? And we believe that we are part of the end times church. So the question is, what is Jesus going to do in the end times church? How do you answer the question? The answer to the question is, if you want to uh, discover what Jesus is going to do in the end times church, you have to go to the early church. Where's the early church in the book of Acts, the first church? you want to understand what Jesus is going to do in the last church, you've got to understand what Jesus is doing in the first church, the early church, the book of Acts. So what you discover in the book of Acts, the first church, the early church, is exactly what Jesus is going to do in the last church, the final church. And without understanding these dynamics, we try to decipher what God is trying to do in the end time. We fail miserably time and time again. Because this is the fundamental principle, unchanging fundamental principle that God has laid before us. If you want to understand the end, you have to understand the beginning. Now that that's settled, I want to give you something else on the PowerPoints, please. Now, I don't expect you to know who this man was. His name was Nicholas Copernicus. A uh, man was born in Poland. He was a scientist, astronomer, mathematician. He was many things in one. He was a brilliant man to say he was the Einstein of his time. He lived about 500 years before us. Now, um, I've been to his home. It's a tourist attraction today in, in Poland. So I've been to his home because this man taught us something very, very important. For a long time, the people of the then known world who believed what they lived in during the Dark Ages believed that the sun revolved around the earth. They believed this for a very, very long time, that the sun revolved around the earth and that the earth is in the center and the sun revolves around it. Then came Nicholas Copernicus. As he stared into the starry skies, he discovered the very opposite. Now he was shocked, surprised to make this discovery. He discovered, no, it's not the sun that's revolving around the earth. It's the other way around. It's the earth that's revolving around the sun. So when he first made this discovery, it was such a shocking news to the world then, who has come to believe just the opposite for thousands of years. And his friend says, don't go public with this information. They'll kill you. They'll call you a heretic. But he said, this is truth. And I need to speak out the truth. So he went public. Interestingly, at the time that he began to release this vital revelation, there were other scientists in other parts of the world, namely Germany, who concurred, who agreed, hey, this, is, this man is right. 
And ever since that, our understanding of the universe has changed dramatically and drastically. And the fact that Neil Armstrong was able to land on the moon has direct correlation with this man's revelation, how he understood the universe. The reason why I share this illustration is because as Christians for thousands of years, thousands of years, just like the people in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, we believe that everything revolves around the church. The church is in the center and everything revolves around the church. And you take a second look at the scriptures, the word of God, you discover, no, uh, the kingdom does not revolve around the church. It's the other way around. The church revolves around the kingdom. So what you put in the center matters. In the early days, they put earth in the center and the sun around it. And they could not figure out how the universe functioned. Thousands of years. Then came Copernicus, said, no, it's the other way around. So we, for the last 2,000 years, we have imported a very wrong idea that the church is in the center and the kingdom of God around it. It's actually the other way around. The kingdom of God is in the center and the church around it. Once you revise this positioning of what's in the center of God's universe, it's the kingdom of God, not the church. The church is there, but it's the kingdom of God that's in the center. That you begin to see the book of Revelation open up its you. Because if Jesus is coming back to us as king, then you have to understand the kingdom of God. Without understanding the kingdom of God, if your heart is not open to the kingdom of God, if your mind is shut to the kingdom of God, you will never be able to see the king. Because the king comes because of the kingdom of God. So who, he who began uh, establishing his kingdom in the Gospels is coming to expand and export the kingdom of God as we come to the book of Revelation. So this is where you and I need to begin. We need to be radically open to the idea that everything revolves around the word kingdom. Take the Gospel of Matthew for example. The word church appears two times in the Gospel of Matthew, two times. The word kingdom appears 55 times. Watch up, go. 55 times in the Gospel. Versus two times church. So it's a very clear statement as far as Jesus was concerned that everything revolves. It's the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. Kingdom. Everything revolves around the kingdom. And then we come into the book of Acts and we come to chapter 1 verse 3. And there Luke records for us that 40 days since resurrection, in other words, if Jesus is here today, this will be part of the 40 days that he was on earth from resurrection to ascension. Remember, 40 days he was on earth, so he would be on earth right now. And what was Jesus teaching his disciples for 40 days to pray? He wasn't teaching them church growth. He wasn't teaching them evangelism. He wasn't teaching them discipleship. He was teaching them one singular topic. Kingdom of God, Acts chapter 1 verse 3. So that's the first thing we discover in the first chapter of the book of Acts. Turn to the last chapter of the book of Acts chapter 28 verse 31. And again, you find Paul speaking, teaching on the subject of the kingdom of God. There's something the early church understood that we have failed since. The early church understood the kingdom of God is in the center. The church revolves around it. By the time the gospel from Israel came to Europe, Everything shifted. They moved the kingdom of God to the outside and brought the church on the inside. And once that happened, we lost sight of what was radically important for you and I, the kingdom of God. And because we could never understand the concept of the kingdom of God, we could never understand the king of the kingdom of God, Jesus. Which is why we struggle to receive Jesus as king of kings and as lord of lords. We are stuck with our vision as Jesus as Savior. He is our Savior. Was always is our Savior. The one who's coming back is not coming back as Savior. He's coming back as the King. And that's the revision that you and I need in an hour such as this. So as we come to understand um, the book of Revelation, the first part, part one, Revelation 1 through 12, and then from 12 to 22. Let's see the PowerPoint slides. Okay, so this is basically an overview 
and I would like to give you some thoughts for you to seriously consider and consider praying about. Now, while you're looking at their slide, this is what I want to say. Now, don't get caught up with that. Listen. This is more important, all right? So that you can catch up later. But listen to what I'm saying. The book of Revelation was a revelation from Jesus to the churches in Asia. Now this is significantly important. All right? Maybe turn it off. Turn it off. All right? People have a double vision when they see this and they try to do it. All right? I'll, I'll bring it back. But just hear this. When you come to Revelation 1 and then you read the very first chapter, Jesus has something important to say to the churches in Asia. Now, I don't know about you, but that demands that we pause there for a moment and, and ask Jesus, Jesus, why is it that you have a word only to the churches in Asia? Why did you identify Asia? Why did you single out Asia? Why not the others. And Jesus has a reason. And this is where you and I need to understand because our friends in the West will never say this. They cannot say this. And they will not say this. But I am from the East. So I can say this. So listen very carefully. Everything began in the middle, in the center. Jerusalem. According to Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 5, Jerusalem the center of the earth. According to Ezekiel 38 and verse 12, Jerusalem is the center of the earth. So Jerusalem is the center of the earth. Everything began in the center of the earth. What began here, according to the book of Acts, began to move westward. It crossed the Mediterranean Sea and came to Europe in Acts chapter 16. Alright, so it began in Jerusalem, moved to Judea, Samaria, and then slowly it was moving to the ends of the earth. So it crossed the Mediterranean Sea and came to Europe. So you need to understand this geographical movement. As the gospel came into Europe for a thousand of years, God did great things in Europe, great things in Europe, uh, with the climax of the Reformation in 1517 in Germany and in Wales, Welsh Revival, 1904. Great things happened in Europe. But then God is not static. God is moving on. So he crossed the body of waters called the Atlantic Ocean, came to America, and we discovered that God was giving birth to great revivals in 1727 to 1729 in New York on the eastern seaboard of the USA with the ministry of uh, Charles G. Finney. And then the Spirit of God began to move westward, came to Azusa, Los, Los Angeles, California, and there he gave birth to one of the greatest movements ever in history called the Azusa Street Revival. Out of that came the Pentecostal movement. I'm a product of that. So the one element that is true of God is God is on the move. God is not static. God is on the move. If you know anything about our God, is our God is on the move. So what's the key to leading a victorious life? As God moves, we move. The story that we have in Numbers chapter 9 is a cloud move, the people move as a cloud stay, the people stay. It's a cloud move, the people move as a cloud stay, the people stay. That's the critically important thing. God is not static. God is moving, on the move. And then when God was done in America, Again, the Spirit of God crossed the body of waters called the Pacific Ocean and is coming to the islands. Now this is important because you and I need to understand this because the largest group of islands are in the Pacific Ocean. Here in the Pacific Ocean. So I'm trying to draw an imaginary picture. Jerusalem, Mediterranean Sea, Europe, Atlantic Ocean, America, Pacific Ocean. What is God up to? God is going round. What we call the circumnavigation of the gospel. He began in Jerusalem. He's going back to Jerusalem. But how is he going back to Jerusalem? He's going back this way. So his last stopover before visiting Jerusalem is Asia. Pacific, Asia. Asia is his last stopover before he comes to Jerusalem, Israel. And for those of you who know your geography, Jerusalem, Israel is a part of the continent of Asia. It's the final frontier of Asia. But you and I don't read the Bible with eyes of geography. Because our Western friends have taught us to read the Bible historically, but not geographically. But the Bible is both history and geography. When we come to the book of Genesis, 
Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Is that a historical statement or is that a geographical statement? It's both. You can find both history and geography in Genesis 1 and verse 1. History and geography is found both in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. So you have to allow God to be the God of history. and You have to allow God to be the God of geography. He created the nations after all. Geography is the God of geography. So he's moving this way. Which is why we who live in Asia, the end time church. So I call this the early church. I call this the European church. I call America the evangelical church. But I call Asia the end time church. And God has reserved the last word, the final word to the end time church, which is Asia. Which is why he singled out the seven churches in Asia. Now, as a theologian and as a biblical scholar, you have to ask the question, Jesus, why did you single out Asia? What about the others? And then he singled out seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, seven churches. So when you start looking at a biblical atlas and you see, all right, let's, let's see. Where is Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea? You'll find that they were in a certain part of the first century AD called Asia Minor, which is today Turkey. All right? But interestingly, all these seven churches that Jesus identified in chapter 1 of Revelation, while they were in Turkey, they were on the Asian side of Turkey. For those of you who know your geography, Turkey today is divided into Asian part and European part. There's a river that separates them called the Bosporus River, and there's a bridge that connects. So on this side are Asian Turks, on this side are the European Turks. You can tell by their looks. Okay, blonde, blue, here, like you and I. So you can tell the difference. And interestingly, while Jesus had the liberty to pick the seven churches, he could have picked any churches, but he picked the seven churches that are on the Asia side. So that raises another question. The question is, John was writing the book of Revelation in 1896. So in 1896, wasn't the church in Rome around? Yes, it was. Then why didn't Jesus include the church in Rome? In that list. In 1896, wasn't the church in Corinth around? Answer, yes, they were around. And why didn't Jesus list that among the seven churches? Question, wasn't the church in Thessalonica around? Yes. Then why didn't Jesus include that church in this list? Why did Jesus single out these seven churches and all seven were on the Asian side of Turkey? Because Jesus is making a point. He said, early church center European church, evangelical church, and times church. Before I return to Jerusalem, my final stopover is Asia. Which is why you and I must hearken unto this message, because these are Jesus' words to the churches in Asia. I come from the church in Asia. It is important for you and I to understand this. Second thing, all right, so Asia. When we talk about Asia, Jesus seems to now zoom in. So first he shows us the big picture, Asia, and then he zooms in. Zooms in where? To islands. It is interesting that when Jesus chose to reveal himself to John concerning the end times, he chose an island to reveal himself, an island called Patmos. Now, I've been to Patmos seven times, all right? And uh, I have a ministry back in Singapore called Patmos. I teach about the end times every week. I've been doing that for the last 21 years. Every Monday I teach in Singapore at a place on a platform called Patmos and I teach about the end times. My favorite topic, end times. So, Patmos. Now, if I was Jesus, I'm not. But if I was Jesus, I would rather reveal myself to John in Ephesus, not in Patmos. Patmos, it's an island. Hey, come on. Why an island? Ephesus, that's a grand city in the mainland. Why not reveal to John on a grand city in the mainland? Ephesus, why would you choose to reveal yourself on an island to John? And the answer came from Jesus because the islands are the ones who will usher in the final revival before the mainlands receive the revival. I hope you are hearing this. The islands will be the ones who will be ushering in the revival 
before the mainland began to receive the revival. In other words, the islands have an, an important role in the end times. Now this most definitely tickled me because I come from an island. I'm from Singapore, I come from an island. So I began to earnestly seek the Lord. I said, Lord, are you serious? Read the word. Island. And so as I began to discover, so you have a plan for the islands, Jesus? Yes. So listen to this. In the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, the disciples had a question for Jesus before he was taken up to the Father in heaven. What was the question? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, even back then, the early church had a clear vision of Jesus as king. And therefore, they saw the kingdom of God. We see Jesus as Savior. Therefore, all we can see is the church. That's why you and I need a radical revisioning of Jesus. The early church, if you had asked Peter, who's Jesus to you? My king. Ask Paul, who's Jesus? King. <laughs> Ask Matthew, who's Jesus? King. Ask Christian today, who's Jesus? Savior. Who's Jesus? Savior. Who's Jesus? How did this happen? How did this happen? They saw Jesus in a very different light. We see Jesus in a very different light. And is that the reason why they were overcomers in their day and time? Because they saw yeah, Jesus as king. And king had authority to overcome all obstacles. And we don't. So we live defeated lives all the time. Because we, we don't have a right perspective of what Jesus is. So going back to Acts chapter 1 verse 6. So when the question was popped before Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Kingdom to Israel. Because they recognized him to be the king and therefore kingdom to Israel. They recognized he was the king of Israel. And Jesus replied, you do not understand um, the time and the seasons that my father has set in. You shall receive the spirit and you shall become my witnesses first in Jerusalem, the center of the earth. Judea, Samaria, and of the earth. Now, depending on what translation you read, if you're reading a loose translation or a free translation, the translator would have indicated ends of the earth as in plural, E-N-D-S. If you're having an NIV, you have ends, E-N-D-S. But if you're reading an NASB, if you're reading an ESV, if you're reading a King James or you're reading a New King James, you will not have the word ends as in plural, you will have the word end as in singular. Now that makes a big difference. End of the earth is one particular locale on the earth. Ends of the earth are the four corners, north, south, east, west. So was Jesus referring to ends of the earth, north, south, east, west? Or was Jesus referring to one particular locale on earth, end of the earth? Now, you have to go back to Jesus' world. If you stick to the original Greek and the literal rendering of the word, there's only end, there's no ends. So what did Jesus mean by end of the earth? To understand the end of the earth, you have to begin by asking the center of the earth. So Jerusalem is the center of the earth. I already told you that. So the world we live in is round globe. Okay, so imagine I have an orange in my hand and I have a sharp object that where the eye of the orange is, that, that symbolizes Jerusalem, the center of the earth. I put a pin through that eye of the orange through Jerusalem and let the pin go through the orange and pop out on the other side. Wherever it pops out on the other side, that's the end of the earth. If this is the center, that's the end. So if you do that with the globe, Jerusalem, and you let the needle go through and pop up on the other side, guess where you're coming? You're coming to the Pacific Ocean, where the islands are. Now, strange but not strange, why Jesus would draw an invisible line called the International Date Line across New Zealand. Why would he do that? Now, nobody will insist that you can see this line, the international date line. But anybody who has crossed from the Eastern Hemisphere into the Western Hemisphere or the Western Hemisphere into the Eastern Hemisphere, you know that you crossed the line because everything changes. Day changes, time changes. I remember one time we were heading for Tahiti from Singapore. So our stopover was Auckland, New Zealand. So we celebrated the birthday of a person who was traveling with us in Singapore at the airport. And then, given the day that the person was born, when we hit Auckland, it was still the same day. 
It's, it was actually the next day as Singaporeans, but in Auckland it was the same day. So we had to celebrate the birthday yet once again. And then when we reached Tahiti, guess what? The same day appeared again. So we celebrated the birthday of this person three times, but became, we became acutely aware, oh my Jesus, we have passed through three different geographical locations, and yes, the same day. So that's the international deadline. Okay, so with New Zealand, Australia, international deadline. So why would Jesus draw the line there? That's Jesus' way of saying to you and I, if Jerusalem is the center of the earth, this is the end of the earth. So listen now carefully. Acts 1 and verse 8. You shall be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, end of the earth. And then he stopped. Here. So the question was, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And the answer was, it all has to do with the end of the earth. The end of the earth is the key. And what do you find in the end of the earth? Islands. Islands. And this is where I began to receive revelation concerning islands. So I began to dig deep. I said, Lord, show me more. Show me more. And as I began to dig deep into the islands, I began to dig into history. So for those of you who know anything about the Pacific Islands, I want to name you one Pacific Island called Solomon Islands. I don't expect you to know where Solomon Islands is, but if you know where New Zealand is, you can find your way to the Solomon Islands. All right? Um, Australia, New Zealand, Solomon Islands. Now interestingly, Solomon Islands has an interesting history. It all began in the year 1995. Sorry, yeah, 1895, not 1895, 1895. Now, something interesting happened there in 1895. When Solomon Islands received the gospel, Solomon Islands was reputedly the last island in the Pacific Ocean to receive the gospel, Solomon Islands. The last island in the Pacific Ocean to receive the gospel, 1895. When that happened, many other things happened. As if like a domino card. Right after 1895, we have the year uh, we, we come to France, Paris, where a riot broke out. The riot was all about a Jewish man called Captain Dreyfus, a, re, a Jewish man who was a captain in the French army who was falsely accused of treason, and he was thrown into prison. And so the Jewish people began to take the streets and to riot publicly. So this became big news. His name was Alfred Dreyfus. And so a journalist from Switzerland decided to fly down to Paris to cover the story because it was a big story. So as he came, that story eventually became his own story where he couldn't go back. And night after night, he began to hear voices saying, it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time. And this man was going crazy. Time for what? Time for what? It's time for what? And then finally he heard the voice of God say, it's time for Israel to come back. Israel? Israel to come back? Now you need to know back in 1895, it's been 2,000 years since there's never been Israel. Israel disappeared from the face of the world map in the year 587 BC. When Babylon invaded Judah, it was the end of Israel. Israel ceased to be Israel in 587 BC and ever since that there has been no Israel on the map of the world it disappeared and so having disappeared from the map of the world for 2000 years and this man is now hearing it's time for Israel to come back he could not put the pieces together what do you mean it's time for Israel to come together so God was remembering his promise to his people that at the right time I will bring you back Isaiah 66 and verse 8 so not knowing the full story, he decided to take a step of faith and call for the elite Jews who were living in Europe back at that time. And they all came together in the year 1897 in a place called Basel, Switzerland. I've been there. I've stood in the very place. And so this is what happened back in history. And this man called that moment the first Zionist Congress. The first Zionist Congress, 1897, Basel, Switzerland. And when they came together... The Jews, these elite Jews, very powerful Jews who lived in different parts of Europe had a question, why did you invite us here? What's the big story? 
And this man, this man said, I have a word. Now he's not a preacher. All right, he's not a pastor. He said, I have, I have a word. What's the word? And then he said this, all right? He said, perhaps in five years. And he was pointing to the people who were sitting on the front row as old as he was. Okay, people who would definitely be alive for at least for the next five years. And then he pointed his fingers to this man. He says, perhaps in five years, but certainly in 50 years. And he was pointing to the two young men who were standing as ushers at the door. Certainly in 50 years, we Jews will have Israel as our homeland. And when he said those words, the jaws dropped open. You can understand the shock that prevailed amongst the people because Israel had disappeared from the world map for 2,000 years. Now you tell me a nation that disappeared had reappeared. Never in history. So when he said this, the ball started rolling. And then one thing led to another, one thing led to another, one thing led to another. And then we come to World War I. World War I, 1914. It began in 1914. And Britain was the main defender of the free world against Germany. But Britain was losing the war. Why? Because Britain was running out of ammunition. And in order to war off the attacks of the Germans and to defeat the Germans, Britain urgently needed ammunition. But Britain didn't have ammunition, didn't have the time to manufacture enough ammunition to win the war. So here comes a man. His name was Chaim Weizmann, a Jew. Now the first man, the journalist, his name was Theodore M. Herzl. Today if you go to Israel, you'll find his picture right next to the Prime Minister's or the President's picture. Theodore M. Herzl, the founder of modern Israel. Theodore M. Herzl. The man who succeeded him was Chaim Weizmann. So Chaim Weizmann was a chemist by profession. And so he told the king, I can help you. I can do the magic you want. I can give you the ammunition in the short time that you need. No one has ever done that. He said, I can do that for you. And he did exactly that. So in time, to, uh, many ammunition was manufactured. And because of that, Britain won the war. As Britain won the war, after the victory in 1917, the king invited Chaim Weizmann to the courts and said, you have done us a great service. What can we possibly do in return to express our kindness? And Chaim Weizmann, without blinking his eyes, said, give us back our homeland. So that was the first time when the British foreign minister came up with this document in 1917 called the Balfour Declaration, 1917. In return for what this Jew had done for the British, the British decided to extend the kindness. Now that Palestine was under their rule, the Ottoman Turks had occupied Palestine, including Jerusalem, Israel, for 400 years. 1517 to 1917, 400 years. Now it has come under the hold of the British. The British said, all right, we give you back Israel. So that was the beginning. But then I've stood before the Knesset in Israel. Knesset means the parliament. I've spoken to the parliament. I've spoken to the president. I've spoken to the prime minister. I said, Israel exists today because of the islands in the Pacific. So they said, say that again. Israel exists today because of the islands in the Pacific. He said, how is that? How did that happen? So I begin to tell them the story that I'm just telling you. Solomon Islands, 1895. The last island in the Pacific Ocean to receive the gospel. Once that happened, Jesus said, time. It's time for me to restore the kingdom back to Israel. So Israel comes back. So we as islands in the Pacific Ocean have an important role and responsibility to play in the end times. And this is the critical word for this season. Now, yes, Penang is part of Malaysia. But understand this, Malaysia, West Malaysia, is a mainland. Whereas Penang, Palau Pinang, is an island. Sabah is part of Malaysia. It's East Malaysia. Sarawak is part of Malaysia. East Malaysia. But Sabah and Sarawak are part of an island called Borneo, Kalimantan. Therefore, the plans and the purposes that Jesus has for the islands is not exactly the same as that he has for the mainlands. And this is where you need to understand 
It always takes the horse to pull the cart. If Malaysia, West Malaysia is the cart, then the horse that pulls this cart called West Malaysia are the islands. Penang, Sabah, Sarawak. You are key in God's end time plans. And going down to the Pacific Ocean, Australia. I keep telling my friends in Australia, yes, you are a continent, but you are an island. Uh, for them, it's hard to imagine. We are so big. You see, yes, you are big, but you are an island. You are an island. You are an island. New Zealand, you are an island. So listen to this. Whenever I'm in Australia or in New Zealand, I keep telling them this. Australia, New Zealand, are you part of the East or are you part of the West? Historically, politically, they are part of the West. All right, if you understand the history behind Australia and the history behind New Zealand, the flag, they have the union jack there. In other words, they are a product of Britain. So they have, as part of their flag, the flag of Britain, the union jack there. So they regard themselves as a product of the West. So this is what I tell my friends in Australia and New Zealand. If you choose to believe that you are a product of history, politically, politically, the West, then God can do nothing in you. Why? Because what God did in the West is over. That's what I call the first half. Which is why we don't see anything new happening neither in Europe nor in America. Because that's history, what I call the first half of the game. The first half of the game began in Jerusalem, moved across the Mediterranean Sea, came to Europe, moved across the Atlantic Ocean, came to America, now the Pacific Ocean, ends of the earth. So this is what I call the first half. The first half of the game is over. Now, what is about to happen is the second half. The second half is about the Pacific Islands, Asia, back to Jerusalem. This is the second half. And whatever God did in the West... Is history, which is why the West was not included in Revelation 1 and verse 4 where Jesus says, John, I want you to write uh, these letters to the seven churches that are in Asia. He singled out Asia. So, you know, the question is, what about the others? No, Asia. What about the West? Whatever I need to say to the West, I've already said in the book of Acts and everything is in between. Now my final word is to my churches in Asia. So I tell my friends in Australia and New Zealand, it is important that you position yourself rightly before the God of heaven. If you consider yourself to be part of the West, then your story is over. You are part of the first half. On the other hand, if you consider yourself as part of the East, then your story is just beginning. What God is about to do in you has just begun. Now, so I tried to get my Australian and New Zealand friends to think. I asked them, now that we are approaching May, is it getting hotter or colder in Australia and New Zealand? Answer is, it's getting colder. Why? Winter is coming up. Now, same time in the West, America and Britain, is it getting colder or hotter? Hotter, because they are approaching summer. Even nature is trying to say to Australia and New Zealand, you are diagonally opposite. You are not part of the West, you are part of the East. Even nature is trying to say. When they are having winter, you are having summer. When you are having summer, they are having winter. And God has placed you geographically on the Eastern Hemisphere. So Jerusalem, end of the earth. And the last island here on this international dateline is an island called Tonga. Have you heard of Tonga? Right? Tonga is a kingdom. The last island on the Western Hemisphere is Tonga. The first island on the Eastern Hemisphere is Fiji. And so I have devoted my time to go all the way up to Fiji and try to usher these islands to prepare the way for the King of Glory to come back to Jerusalem. The islands play a key role in all of this. And when we speak about islands, now I show up in KL every once in a while. And I don't know if you know SIBKL. Pastor Chu, all right? So I tell him the reason why God is visiting his church more than any other church I know in West Malaysia is because of his involvement in East Malaysia. So he says, what in East Malaysia? I said, Sabah, Sarawak. Because it's an island. 
So I have, in the last five years now, I've been trying to teach him about the role of the islands in the end time plans of God. So he's beginning to receive that revelation. So every year I go back and try to reinforce the revelation. So you are Malaysia, but then you are Palapina. So you need to understand that although you are a part of Malaysia, you are distinct from mainland Malaysia. And so, even in history, go back to history, all right? What's the best way to understand prophecy? The best way to understand prophecy is to understand history. So go back. At that time, the custodian of the gospel, the Christian gospel, was given to the United Kingdom, Britain, United Kingdom. They became the chief missionary force to all the world. Okay, I'm talking about the 1600s now. It began in the year 1600 when the East India Company was formed and then they began to evangelize the world, colonize the world, but at the same time evangelize the world. So they colonized Malaysia, they colonized Singapore. But even while they colonized Malaysia and colonized Singapore, they evangelized Malaysia and they evangelized Singapore. So we need to understand that it comes as a package. They colonize us, but they also evangelize us. Now, so if God had chosen the United Kingdom to be the chief custodian of God's end time revelation, understand, we say Great Britain, we say United Kingdom, but then there's another way to describe this country. So if you say Great Britain, you are right. If you say United Kingdom, you are right. But then there's also another word, the British Isles. British Isles, God chose an island family to be the chief custodian of what he wants to do in the end times and he gave it to Great Britain. So the world insists on looking at Great Britain as the United Kingdom while we as God's people need to look at the United Kingdom as the Isles, the British Isles, islands. Islands. So once you start to see that, wow, God, what are you trying to say to us here? That you're giving your end time revelation to a group of islands. And this group of islands began to colonize, evangelize, not just mainlands, but islands. Singapore being one of them. And yeah, Malaysia. So when the East India Company decided to pay a visit to Malaysia, what was then Malaya, where was their port of entry? For the Catholics, Malacca. All right? But not for the British. For the British, the port of entry to Malaysia was through a man called Francis Light. Recognize his name? Where did he come from? Penang. Now, why was Penang the point of entry? So you need to connect these dots. <clears throat> because if you want to understand prophecy, you need to understand history. So why did God choose Britain, the British Isles, and then get them to evangelize mainlands and islands. But as far as the East India Company was concerned, the evangelistic arm of the British Empire, Penang. And down south, Singapore. Singapore. This was the point of entry. And if you try to understand why would they choose the islands instead of the mainlands, they have a reason. They have a very important reason why God led Francis Light to Penang, the island of Penang, and why God led Sir Thomas Temple Raffles, another member of the East India Company of the British Empire, to the island of Singapore. Everything we are today is because of the fact that we are an island. We are an island. And now, the thing about being an island is, on the one hand, you are part of the island family called the Pacific, on the other hand, you are part of the mainland called Asia. We are this and we are that. Take Singapore. Is Singapore, is, is Singapore part of the Pacific or is Singapore part of Asia? Now, if you ask any Singaporean, the answer would be, we are part of Asia. But then, technically, we are not. Because the only link that Singapore has with Malaysia is the artificial causeway and the two second link that connects us. That wasn't there all the time. You know, only the causeway was only constructed in 1824. So prior to that, Singapore was an island separated from Malaysia. Only 1824, the causeway was built. And because the causeway was built, we consider now we are the southernmost part of 
Asia. No, we are not the southernmost part of Asia. Malaysia is. We artificially became the southernmost part. We were not naturally the southernmost part of Asia. Malaysia is. So we understand Asia, the southernmost part of Asia is Malaysia. And when it comes to the southernmost part of Asia, Penang is the island that represents Malaysia. So there is something important about Penang that you and I need to understand for such a time as this, that we need a revelation of Jesus the King in this island, which is what this convention is all about. This is a King's Convention, and in this King's Convention, we are inviting the people who are the sons and daughters of this island called Pulau Binang to receive a vision, a revision of Jesus as King. As you begin to receive this vision of the King, you will begin to receive a vision of the Kingdom of God. And as you receive the a revelation of the kingdom of God, then Malaysia begins to take form and shape to become an extension of the kingdom of God. Now, the enemy has singled out this nation for a variety of reasons to be a part of his agenda. Now, when I say the enemy, I'm speaking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist has a huge agenda for Malaysia. You, you know that. And at the same time, Jesus Christ has a huge agenda for Malaysia. So this has become the focal point of many things that are happening. And one of the things that uh, we as the church need to receive and release is the love for Israel amongst Malaysians. Now I realize in the natural this is not possible. Because the ideology is contrary to loving Israel. And they have the unnatural reasons. So for this to happen, there has to be a supernatural intervention where Malaysia, as a nation, begins to love Israel. Not hate Israel. Love Israel. Why? Because there is a fundamental rule as far as the word of God is concerned, if you love Israel, you bless Israel. If you curse Israel, you hate Israel. And the enemy has you in the right place. And so the churches within the state of Malaysia needs to understand this dynamic and to stand in the gap for the nation and to allow this nation to come to the place where God can bless this nation. Our goal for Malaysia is that Malaysia will come into her redemptive gifting. Whatever God has called Malaysia to be and for Malaysia to become, that's our goal for Malaysia. But no nation on the face of the earth can ever come into their destiny if they don't have a right relationship with Israel. And this is the key. And I can appreciate many a time where Malaysians coming to Israel, they bless Israel. Just a moment ago when I walked in here, none of you were here, I was one of the first to walk in here. One of your people, a Malaysian, came over and handed me a love gift. And I asked him, what is this for, sir? And he said, Israel. So that man gives me hope. That man, that brother gives me hope that there are people here in Malaysia who love Israel. And all it takes is for a remnant, a, a certain remnant, to turn this tide against Malaysia because Malaysia must have an upper hand when it comes to the things of God. And it takes the people of God to steer this nation in the right direction. This is not part of my um, planned teaching, but I'll say this anyhow. As an Assemblies of God person, I grew up all my life as a church planter. My brother was a church planter. I am a church planter. All right? And today I'm planting churches in Israel. That's, that's what I do. Right? I don't say this out publicly, but this is what I do in Israel. I'm planting churches in Israel. So I'm a church planter. That's in my blood, my DNA. I'm a assemblies of God. I'm a church planter. But I've always carried this idea that, so why do I have to plant churches? And the idea that I had subscribed to was that I have to plant churches so that souls can be won, so that 
people can go to heaven. That was my original idea. Now, after 1998, everything has changed. Now I understand the purpose of church planting very differently. So if you ask me now, why do we have to plant churches? The answer to that question is, because without a church in a given nation, that nation can never discover, a nation can never develop, a nation can never discharge a God-given destiny. So just like a ship, no matter how big the ship is, you have the captain, Jesus, but the captain needs to steer the helm and the rudder is the one that determines which direction this big ship goes. In comparison to size, the ship may be this big and the rudder this small. And yet it's the rudder that determines the direction of the ship. So I understand today that the church is the rudder of a nation. So if a church is compared to <clears throat> a ship, then no ship can ever reach its destination without the rudder. And that's why the church is absolutely vital to be planted in every nation. So no church, the nation has no hope of discovering, developing or discharging their destiny. So now I have a new understanding as to why there have to be churches in every nation, including Israel. So if you understand that, <clears throat> then you need to understand that you are part of the church and therefore you are the rudder of Malaysia. Now Malaysia is huge. The church is small. So what? It's always the rudder that determines the direction of the ship. So it is up to us as the church to think and act like the rudder, steering the ship Godward towards its God-given destiny or destination. So uh, I'm never perturbed or discouraged by the fact that <clears throat> the nation may hate Israel, but the church in Malaysia loves Israel. You understand what I'm saying? So, it is not up to the ship to decide where to go. It's up to the rudder to determine where the ship is going. And there are enough people in Malaysia who love Israel. Like I said, the first thing that came to me when I, when I received it was a love offering for Israel. Now tell me, what is God trying to tell me? God is trying to tell me, son, I have people here in Malaysia who love Israel. Son, I want you to know something. I not only have people who love Israel here in Malaysia, I have people who love Israel here in Island Penang. That's the first thing that happened to me when I walked in here. I mean, 10 others could have walked in, offered me a bottle of water, shake my hands or what. But that's the first thing that happened here this evening. God is saying something to me. For me that was, God, thank you for that. For that. Not the money, I don't even know how much is inside the envelope. But the fact that a man from Penang, Malaysia, came to put something in my hands that this is a gift for Israel. That says something solid to me. So as, as the people of God here in this island, Penang, we need to understand this bigger picture that Malaysia is the ship, but the church is the rudder. Malaysia is the peninsula, but Penang is the island. And so if God is going to visit the mainland, the peninsula called Malaysia, the entry point is the other islands. So on the eastern side, Sabah, Sarawak. On the western side, Pulau Pinang. Pulau Pinang. So you have an extra role to play, an extra responsibility to pray, an extra revelation to receive. You cannot behave like I'm Malaysia. Therefore, I'll behave like the rest of Malaysia. No, you... you you are not the rest of Malaysia. Like I said, you are the rudder of Malaysia. Penang is the rudder of Malaysia. You have to decide which way Malaysia goes. And that's the revelation that God is giving to us for such a time as this. And as we move through Revelations 2, 3, 4, 5, John, as he writes the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and then he comes to Revelation 4 in verses 1 and 2 where Jesus takes him up from Patmos and takes him up to Jerusalem, I mean to heaven. And when John comes up into heaven, this is important for you to understand. Huh? We are talking about Revelation 4 now. Starting with verse 2 all the way down, the, all the chapters, the first thing that John sees, the first thing that John sees as he comes up into heaven, 
is a throne. The second thing he sees is a throne. The third thing he sees is a throne. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh thing he sees is a throne. Then when he comes to chapter 5, throne, throne, throne. So John, who was with Jesus in the Gospels, who saw him as Savior, the last one who saw Jesus die was John. You know, the others all fled. The only one remaining standing before Jesus at the cross was John. And Jesus said to John, Son, your mother, mother, your son, and then he died. So the only one standing before Jesus and who saw Jesus on the cross as Savior was John. So John was a very familiar man who knew the, the Savior Jesus. Now, fast forward to the last book of the Bible. In the island of Patmos, when Jesus reveals himself to John, Revelation 1 verse 17 tells us that John fell at his feet like a dead man. Why would John freak out on seeing Jesus? Is this not the Jesus he was leaning on whose bosom he was? Five times in the Gospels, we have the statement, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus best friend was John. John was very, very intimate with Jesus. But the Jesus that he was intimate with was the Savior, Jesus. The one he saw on the cross as he died. Now, fast forward, we come to the, from the Gospels to the last book, the book of Revelation. John gets another vision of Jesus. And this time he's terrified, absolutely terrified. He freaks out. He falls at his feet like a dead man. Jesus lifts him up and said, I am the one who was, who is, and is to come. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I was dead and I am alive forevermore. Get up. And then Jesus invites him, come up here to heaven and I will show you what is going to happen in the future. And as John is taken up in Revelation chapter 4, like I said, the only thing he saw, he could have seen a thousand different things, but his main focus was the throne, the throne, the throne, the throne. What was Jesus trying to show? What was Jesus trying to say? Uh, what was Jesus trying to share to John? John, you have known me as Savior. Now look again. I am the king who seated on the throne. I am the king who seated on the throne. And this is the vision that the church desperately needs. A vision of Jesus as king. Let me ask you a very practical question. Because you and I always choose to remember that Jesus is hanging on the cross. And that's the Jesus who saved you and I from our sins. But here's a question. How long was Jesus hanging on the cross? Answer, six hours. From nine in the morning to three in the afternoon. Jesus was hanging on the cross for six hours. How long has Jesus been seated on the throne? Two thousand years. And yet, and yet, he has been on the cross for six hours. He has been on the throne for two thousand years. And yet, when our focus, when we, when we pray to Jesus, which Jesus do we see? The one hanging on the cross or the one seated on the throne? You and I have been programmed to look at the Jesus hanging on the cross. But he was there only for six hours and we seated on the right hand of the Father for the last 2,000 years. Why don't we see that Jesus? See, this is where the game has been played on you and I. So we are stuck with this Jesus, like John. And then when John saw this Jesus, he was terrified, petrified, panicked, freaked out. And then Jesus said, come up here, I'll show you something. The throne. Everything is about the throne. Jesus seated on the throne was the vision that John needed. And then everything else followed. Chapter 5. When we come to chapter 5, the big deal in chapter 5 is about the father is seated on the throne with a scroll in his right hand. And this scroll is sealed with seven seals and it is writing both inside and outside. And then a strong angel steps forward and makes this announcement. Who is worthy to take the stroll and to break its seals and at first nobody comes and as nobody comes to receive this scroll John begins to weep read Revelation chapter 5 John begins to weep and as John begins to weep someone gets up and walks to the father interestingly that someone is Jesus where Jesus comes before the father and says father I'll take the scroll I'll take the scroll now, as Christians, we have no understanding what, what is going on there. Now, as Savior, he asks for souls. But as King, he asks for nations. Now, we, ask, we need to understand this. As Savior's primary interest, souls. 
He has come to save us from our sins to win our souls. All right. So a savior's primary interest is souls, but the king's primary interest are not souls, nations. Kings conquer nations. You need to understand that. So as we come to understand that Jesus in the book of Revelation, his primary interest are nations. So we come to the Gospels. When you go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you find name after name after name after name after name. Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary and Magdalene and Lazarus and Nicodemus. I mean, every page is filled with name after name, names of individuals. Now when you come to the book of Revelation, find a single name. You will not find any. Why? Because his focus has shifted from the individuals to the nations. Which is why in Revelation 5, 12, Revelation 7, 9, and all the way down, we find the final book saying, every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. So the focus of Jesus before he returns shifts from the individual to the nations. It began with the individuals, but it ends with the nation because it's coming back as king. Which is why you and I as Christians need to embrace a national theology. That as, as much as Jesus loves me, Jesus loves Malaysia. You need to embrace that idea. As much as Jesus has a calling for me, Jesus has a calling for Malaysia. You need to embrace that idea. And the fact that as much as Jesus has a plan for me, Jesus has a plan for Malaysia. As much as Jesus has a destiny for me, Jesus has a destiny for Malaysia. And I find my biggest struggle is to convince Christians about God's love for the nations. So we go back to Psalm 1. And then we come to Psalm 2, the second Psalm, okay? Psalm 1 is something that we all know, but Psalm 2. Psalm 2, chapter, Psalm 2 and verse 8. So the Father is seated on the throne and the Son is seated at his right hand here. And the Father is saying to the Son, okay? Ask of me for the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. Go ahead, son, ask me. Now, that psalm was written 3,000 years ago. But the time for Jesus to ask for the nations has not yet come. But there's coming a time when Jesus will start asking for the nation. So in the gospel, Jesus wasn't asking for the nation. He was asking for souls. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus is asking for the nations. The big question is, is he asking for Malaysia? So whenever I pray, I imagine myself kneeling next to Jesus because Jesus is praying uh, in heaven that we know from the book of Hebrews, all right? So I, I imagine myself kneeling next to Jesus and I say, Jesus, Jesus, ask for Singapore. Jesus, ask for Singapore. Ask the Father for Singapore. I keep saying that to him. Because I want Singapore to come under his domain. I want Singapore to be part of his extended kingdom. So I say to Jesus, ask for Singapore. But for Jesus to ask God for Singapore, the church of Singapore need to be crying in one voice, may your will be done for Singapore. May your will be done for Singapore. May your will be done for Singapore. And the church is... When it comes to revelation of the nations, we are really on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 being terrible, 10 being very good. We are at 2. We don't have a theology concerning the nations. Why is that? In part 2, I'll cover that. But here, as we are approaching 7.30, let me try to land the plane for part 1. So that's Revelation 5. And then we come to Revelation 6 and 7. We have Jesus breaking the seven seals. And then we have Revelation 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, where something significantly happens. So watch my hand here. According to the Bible, what's the next big thing that Jesus is up to? I answer, according to the book of Revelation, to unite the church and Israel. That's what I see in the book of Revelation. The revelation, the spotlight of heaven is right now on the church. But soon, the spotlight will move away from the church and the spotlight will be on Israel. And then soon, the spotlight will move away from Israel and the spotlight will be on the nations. So I have a very simple way of presenting this revelation. CNN. Okay, so what's CNN? C, church. N, nation of Israel. 
and nations of the world. CNN. So what's the next big thing on God's agenda? Jesus' agenda, CNN. For the church to become a part of Israel, to become one, the one new man, Ephesians chapter 2, to become part of the one olive tree, Romans 11, and together as one harvest force, church and Israel, to evangelize the nations. That's how the story ends. My people, you heard me say at the start, how do you understand the end? To understand the end, you have to understand the beginning. All right, so if you understand how Jesus is going to operate in the end time church, you have to understand, uh, ask the question, how did Jesus operate in the early church? So in the early church, who were the dominant harvest force, Jews or Gentiles? The answer, both Jews and Gentiles, they were together worshipping Jesus as a Messiah. Acts chapter 2, everyone who got saved were Jews. Acts 3, Jews. Acts 4, Jews. Acts 5, Jews. Acts 6, Samaria. Acts 8, Samaria. Acts 10, Cornelius, Caesarea, first Gentile to get saved. And then we come to Acts 11, Antioch, Gentiles. So you see the early church first began with Jews and eventually the Gentiles became a part of the church. First Jews and then Gentiles. Together they began to worship the Messiah and they became the dominant harvest force of the first century AD. They were unstoppable. They were unstoppable because the right chemistry came into force. Jews and Gentiles must come together. The enemy saw that. The enemy saw the power of the church as the church came together as Jews and Gentiles worshipping Jesus. So what did the enemy do? Split. Those of us who are pastors, we understand splits. So the enemy came to split Jews and Gentiles. The moment he split us, the end of evangelization. The first century AD, the church was the dominant force. They were unstoppable, invincible. And they harvested the then known Roman Empire. They transformed. Today we don't have that power. So where do we receive this power to transform nation? The answer is CNN. The church needs to merge with Israel. Becoming one in the Lord as a Messiah. Now again, how do you understand this part of the end story? Understand the first part of the story. I ask you a question. Why is the first story in the Bible about a man called Adam and a woman called Eve? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why is the first story? And God could have told us a million other stories. He could have told us about Aladdin and his wonderful lamb. But Jesus, God did not tell us that story. Why did God tell us a story about Adam and Eve? Because God was making a point. What was the point? You need to understand my first story because then you'll understand my last story. Okay, God, what's the first story? First, I created Adam. Yes, that I know God. And then after a gap, I created Eve. Yes, I know that to God. But I took Eve out of Adam. Yes, God, I know that too. So Adam was one entity and Eve was another entity. But when they came together, they became one. Do you know that? Yes, God, I know that. Now, why am I saying this as my first story? Because in the end, okay, all of the Old Testament was Israel, Adam. All of the New Testament was Eve, the church. Just like Eve came out of Adam, the church came out of Israel. Everything we have comes out from Israel. The Bible was given to us by Israel. The good news we received came from Israel, the apostles. The gift of salvation, Israel. Everything we have comes from Israel. The church is an extension of Israel. So just like there was a gap, Adam, and then gap, Eve, Israel first, gap, 400 years of silence, church. But the church, like Eve, came out of Adam. But the trick is, the story doesn't end with Adam and Eve. The story, the highlight of the story was, Adam was one entity, Eve was one entity. But when they came together, the two became one. Why is that the first story? Because that's the last story. Where the church must become one with Israel, and Israel must become one with the church, and we become one in the Messiah. When we become that, then we become the harvest force. The unstoppable harvest force. And that's where the story ends. So once the church understands this revelation, that we need to become one with Israel, and Israel and the church together evangelize the nation. So we have C and N. 
Otherwise, this is not going to happen. This is God's agenda. Please stand as we conclude this part of the Revelation, which is why Revelation chapter 12 concludes with Israel. Now, just one thing before we uh, take a break. So I spoke to you about Revelation 6 to 8, uh, 6 and 7, and then, okay, now this is, okay, middle, huh? Revelation 12. Okay, wash my hand here, Revelation 12. What's Revelation 12? When Israel gets saved. So before all Israel is saved, after all Israel is saved. Center. Revelation 12. What's happening in verse 11, chapter 11? What's happening in chapter 10? Now, I can say this to you, and I trust you will catch this revelation. When you read the book of Revelation in chapter 10, chapter 10 of Revelation, chapter 11, multitudes, so listen carefully, multitudes from the Arab countries receive Jesus. That's in Revelation 10 and 11. Multitudes from the Arab nations receive Jesus. And when the Arabs start receiving Jesus, they become the final provocation for the Jewish people, but always seen them as the arch enemy and vice versa. What? Our arch enemy has just become a believer in Jesus? How could that happen? And that becomes the trigger factor for Israel to come into salvation. Father, we thank you for this revelation. As we take our dinner break, we ask of you to be with us around the table of fellowship. But more than the food, we ask of you to be present in our fellowship and allow our hearts to be kindled um, by heavenly fire as we come back after the break to receive the second half of the revelation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.